This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 522, recorded on November 30th, 2020. 18. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, where it's five degrees Celsius and raining, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. You you were kind of sighing there. You, are you tired of the introduction? No, not at all. No, I, I, I'm sorry if you mis, mistook my uh, thought, mode. So this cooler is already 522. It's amazing. Moving along from 500, aren't it, we? It's <laughs> it's hard to keep up. <laughs> also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. It's great weather here. <laughs> Blue sky. Oh, I believe puffy, you. Not puffy clouds, wispy clouds. And uh, temperature 32. So uh, you guys can do the conversion. <laughs> <laughs> easy. Pretty easy. Yeah, let's, let's think about this one. <laughs> from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We got, um, actually, it's kind of cloudy, but it's 73 degrees. And it's supposed to be a gorgeous weekend with temperatures in the 80s. Crazy. Right. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Hello. It's uh, two degrees Celsius here, overcast, and it's supposed to be a crummy weekend with wintry mix and snow and rain. And mm. Snow and rain. Yeah. I have an update. What's that? Oh. My phone hadn't updated. Yeah. It's actually 36, so it's also uh-huh. two degrees it's here. It's going up. Two, okay. It's going up. Well, we're going to get 60-degree weather here on Sunday. I want you to all we know are? that. We are. It's going up to 60 degrees. On Monday, I'm going to Zurich. Zurich. Oh, oh cool. Nice. I'm going to see, why? among other people, uh, Urs Graber. Kathy, you must know. Yes, him. yes. We had our adenovirus meeting there, and he w- organized it. It was fabulous. There's a, a periodic table in one of the buildings, you know, with all the elements oh. in it. Uh, Did one you of have those dinner on it? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> not that so, Would you please pass well, the it NACL? Doesn't have, <laughs> it doesn't have all the elements in it, does it? No, wouldn't no, it be it great, though? You're sitting at the table of the periodic table, and when one says, yeah. could you please pass the NACL? <laughs> Just accidentally Do, well, that's not, n- not technically an element, right? I will. Rich, you asked me why I'm going to Zurich. Yes. Why are you going to Zurich? I was invited by the students um, to uh, give a talk. They want me to talk not only about science, but science communication. Mm-hmm. So I'm having a lot of meetings with students. I'm having dinner with them. And then... My host, who she said, uh, while you're actually, I think I'm going to two different places, and, and, and or the Virology Institute. There's also a Virology Institute, right? Wow, okay. which may not be part of the university. I don't know, but they, then she said you could do the TWIV there because they have a lot of virologists. There's so, lots of hills in Zurich, by the way. So Thursday, I'm doing a TWIV there with three guests, including Urs. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm doing there. I'm going. Monday I'll be there, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and come back Friday. Record a TWIV. So next week we don't have to do TWIV. Everybody we don't get to do TWIV. We don't get to do TWIV. You don't get to do it. Wonderful. We don't, we don't, we that's don't get perfect. to do TWIV. That is the perfect way to put it. I'm telling you, I've had a rough morning, and I'm really happy to do this because it's my way of chilling. You're going to depressurize <laughs> now? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a rough, rough, rough life these days, but I'm not complaining. Um, it's just a good yes, break. Yes, you are. Sorry. <laughs> There's some pretty cool stuff to do in Zurich. Um, I'll oh. try and find. Uh, let me know. Let me know. Yes, that yeah, would be great. A walking tour of Rick Steves and also oh, the Lindt right. chocolate shop. It's so, just amazing. I've never been to Zurich. So. Yeah. Zurich. I've been to Zurich. Uh, I've not. So it should be fun and it'll be over quickly. And then I have a bunch. I have two other trips. Uh, then I get back Friday, Sunday, I go to Madison oh. for um, a seminar, also student invited. I'm going to do a podcast with Roland Rooker. All right, mm-hmm. that'll be fun. Which you don't have to say anything. Roland will run the whole thing. <laughs> well, he said to me, uh, you know, I retired 20 years ago. And my memory of virology is pretty fuzzy. So, okay, don't worry about it. We'll try and tease it Perfect. out. Perfect. <laughs> right. And then the following week, I'm going up to Massachusetts. Wow. Very uh, pathetic. And hopefully, Alan can join me for... We're supposed to do a podcast at Tufts Veterinary School, which that's is not too far from you, right? That's a great. When is when is that? 
It's pretty far away from it. It's two Mondays. It's at the other end of Massachusetts. Three Mondays from the next Monday. (laughs) So that's like the 17th? Let me see. Hi, Cal. Let me get my calendar up here. I know no one wants to listen to this, but (laughs) it's part of uh, what we do. Yeah, it's the Monday the 17th. Okay. And I'm trying to get a time so that you know, because I told him I wanted to tell you. Because it's close. He says it's very close to you. Yeah. Tufts Vet. Tufts Veterinary yeah. School. Where is it? Uh, do you know where it is? Tufts Veterinary School. Is it near Worcester? Is it it near is Worcester? in, oh, it's very interesting. Coming School of Veterinary Medicine, Grafton, North Grafton. Grafton. Is that close to you? Um, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't Come on, you're flying from. Put well <laughs> Springfield on it and then you'll see the that's distance. Right. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, a that's, good that's, idea. it's a little east of Worcester. Um, east of Worcester. It's a, but I can. Yeah, it's maybe maybe an hour drive. Okay. Well, we'll, well tell you what time it is. Yeah. So if, uh, I'll give you the details by email. So we're going to talk with a group that we talked about a while ago. They uh, sample seals off the coast for influenza viruses. Islam Hussein is kind of arranging this. Cool. Not kind of. He is arranging it. Is there- hmm. All right. So I want to, before we get to our um, papers, I wanted to talk about something in the news that's really big and quite kind of has to do with virology, and that is the oh, yes. production of genetically engineered humans oh, using CRISPR yes. technology by He Xiangqi in China and the um, huge controversy it has stimulated. And uh, so what he did was to knock out the gene encoding CCR5 in an embryo. Um, that's the co-receptor for HIV. And twins were born, uh, who are apparently, according to him, healthy, and they're with and the mom. We have to say ahead of all of this, according to him. According to him, yes, we have no, we have no paper. There's no peer-reviewed report. There's a video posted to YouTube in which he claims to have done this. We haven't seen any independent sequencing. We haven't seen any validation of this. It's not been peer-reviewed, but he. He says the things that you'd expect somebody to say if they had actually done this, and so yeah. he quite possibly did. So I ran into Sam Sternberg in the elevator the night this broke, and he is a former Doudna protege and did a twin with him. Hmm. And he said George Church has seen the genome sequence, and he says it looks right, but who knows whose right. genome it, is several, it? <laughs> several of the of the reporters who have looked at this say they've um, have have sent it to yeah. um, and independent researchers who do genome analysis and who consistently say, yeah, you know, if this sequence is legit, and that's the big <laughs> caveat on it, this is consistent with it having worked. So mm-hmm. uh, this is either somebody who has done this or somebody who has done a thorough job of faking the data, and we we can't know that so this was done because the husband was hiv positive and they wanted to make sure the children didn't get hiv but of course that's nonsense because there are other ways you can do this um so this is not medically needed to do this and we should say that he had no permission to do the his institution didn't know about this at all he went to this meeting on genetic engineering in, in Hong Kong, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was supposed to present something else, which he had you know, run by the organizers. And he talked about this instead. And everyone was, went up in arms, of course. And he, of course, said, no, it's justified. I can do this. No problem. And, uh, for example, David Baltimore said, uh, this is irresponsible, not open. I think there's been a failure of self-regulation by the scientific community because of the lack of transparency. I think that's the consensus that um, this really should not have been done before getting the proper permissions. Now, this yeah. is a cowboy who just decided to do this because it can be done, right? And uh, he is not at all remorseful, <laughs> but I think he's going to be severely punished by uh, the Chinese authorities because it makes them look like they can't control what's going on. Of course, this could have happened in any number of countries because it's done by an individual scientist. But my, I want to hear everyone's views. But my view is you have to play by the rules. Otherwise, science gets a bad rap. And so, unfortunately, this has opened the box and lots of people are going to want to do this. And I think before we make sure, you know, you have to do proper clinical trials to do this sort of thing. They have to be regulated. And that's the way it works. So I think this is 
really a bad move on his part. But I do know people, and I've known people in the past, and I could see them doing this. You know, there are scientists who would do such a thing. I'm not sure what his motivation was, but I guess he wanted to put a flag in the ground. Dixon, did you hear about this? Sure. What do you think? Everybody thought heard about it. I, I share your view. I think uh, when you start manipulating human beings, whole human beings rather than just pieces of their genome, and uh, produce living entities that, mm. that, that have the signature of what you did, that's wrong. Because that, that's eugenics. And then you're starting to open up a much larger can of – these are not worms, by the way. These are horrible procedures that can result in some very bad things. Kathy, what do you think? I think it's very damaging for trust in science and scientists because I think the vast majority of people – who think about this are pretty worried about the eugenics idea and it, then some fraction of them are going to think that all scientists think like this and mm. and and so i i think it's very bad from that standpoint i mean somebody said to me uh, you know this is the start of the zombie ac- apocalypse <laughs> you know you make somebody resistant to a virus and you can make an army of people resistant to the virus and then and then you release the virus. You know, it it just is. I mean, that's just one example of you know of how a, a non virologist thinks about it. So, uh, yeah, I, I just I, I really am upset about what it does for science. Rich Condit, I agree with everything that's been said. I don't like it. Uh, I think that um, uh, I hope that this individual will be. Um, properly disciplined, my guess is he'll be ostracized by the scientific community. I hope so. Because it's important uh, that an example be set uh, that shows that, you know, um, you know, when things do go wrong, appropriate responsibility is taken for it by the scientific community and appropriate actions are taken. Uh, I was reminded when you were talking of um, when I went to get my underwater diving cert- certification from NAWI, the National uh, something water, Underwater Instructors. Association of Underwater Instructors. There you go. And the the first part of lesson one was you need to understand all of our guidelines here and respect them because after decades, scuba diving is still unregulated. And the reason is no that we regulate, we regulate it ourselves, okay? And if a bunch of people go out and screw up, mm. uh, then the regulators are going to come in and it's going to be worse, all right? Yeah, but Rich, but, that doesn't work because the scuba diving is too universal to regulate it, I'm so, sorry to say. I, I also tried to get regulated by going through that uh, organization. And, and you're right, they're very strict about how they train you. But Patty is the other organization that does that. And uh, and then there are the cowboys. And this is a cowboy, but I've seen cowboys in scuba diving also. At any the rate, distinction I is this... that in scuba diving, the only person who gets killed is the you, one who's doing right. the stupid there, thing. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, At any rate, I hope this, I hope this guy is uh, uh, appropriately uh, yeah, dealt with. Right, right. um, and it sounds like the uh, that is on the way to happening. I think he's going to be executed, frankly. Ooh. It's they've possible. Been, they've been known to do that, right? They have. What do you think, Alan? Uh, well, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said so far. Um, the only thing I'd add is to take a step, one step back from this and ask what the hell we're doing. Um, modifying human embryos for implantation. And every time I see another one of these new reproductive technologies, and I full disclosure, I have an adopted daughter, um, you know, and that's worked out beautifully. And I'm I'm very happy about that. Um, and I don't have a lot of patience for people coming up with bizarre new ways of making more people hmm. because it's not like we have a shortage, you know, so it's not the point, though. I don't think I'm sorry. I know. I understand that's not the point. And I, I <clears throat> am very sympathetic to the desire of parents to have their that's own the point. genetic that is the point. progeny. Yeah. Um, I totally get that. Uh, and yet, you know, 
when you start tinkering around this with this stuff, it is not risk free. It is not uh, without social costs. And I don't think and in this case, you know, when I say not risk free, we actually have evidence emerging that CRISPR is not quite as precise as we had hoped. And it's quite likely that these kids have gotten things other than the CCR5 change. And we don't know if that's going to be damaging. We don't know if the CCR5 change is going to be damaging. We do know that the CCR5 change is not fully protective against HIV and that it's totally unnecessary for protecting a kid whose father is HIV positive. You know, so even this if was, his mother was HIV even, positive. Oh, no, no. It this still is be totally, born normally. You can, you can totally prevent <laughs> transmission right. of the virus from exactly. either parent. This is existing technology Correct. that is available in China. Uh, there was absolutely no need to do this, and it's it's insane to have exposed these children without their consent um, to to this kind of risk uh, for the benefit of I don't know what his reputation. Um, no, it, you know this is it's uh, back for this is I insane, and I I just wanted <laughs> to kind of plant the flag there that in addition. You know, as we start looking at more and more elaborate ways to produce more babies, we need to look at the fact that we have 7 billion people in the world. They don't all already have good families. And maybe we ought to kind of think about that a little bit, too. Some would say this is the beginning of the end. We start mucking with our germline and who knows what's going to happen. And then all, <laughs> all the science fiction books become science I books. I mean, even this simple, supposedly simple procedure where... You knock out CCR5. What could happen because, you know, 10% of the population don't have this gene? Well, maybe it's a different population. Maybe there are other things that allow them to survive and not, you know, there's a lot of questions. Sure. And you, that's why you need clinical trials right. to do these sorts of things, to make sure you're not a cowboy approach. His institution didn't even know about this. Here at no. Columbia, I would be fired. Fired. Well, he was yeah. apparently been on a, he's been on a leave of absence from um, so a Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen is where he's a, uh, on the faculty. Mm. But he's been on a leave of absence since February. And I guess this is what he's been doing. Wow. So he wasn't even at the university. He didn't get any kind of whatever their IRB equivalent is. You know, there are there are rules about this kind of thing in China. They've passed laws regulating what you can and can't do with embryos. Yeah, he, that's what I meant about the, yeah, the I mean, uh, diving instructors. He, yeah, he, he, he had no contact say what you want, with any of that. And so I I think uh, – and, and China is taking this seriously and his university is taking it seriously. Apparently there's a second – he claims there's a second – yeah, yeah, I did hear process. that. Um, I think it's also a failure of his mentors who did not teach him the proper respect for how science is done, right? I complain all the time about IRB and IACUC and this and that, but I follow the rules because they're meant have to. to keep things sane, and he was not properly trained. And it's not surprising because there are a lot of people who aren't properly trained, unfortunately. Well, and speaking of which, Rice University uh, is apparently investigating um, one of his mentors, mm -hmm. uh, who was his graduate advisor, who apparently was uh, may have been involved in this, but that investigation is ongoing. Is there currently uh, a set of uh, universally accepted guidelines mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, this sort of thing? If by universally you mean internationally, no. Uh, yeah, I mean internationally. Yeah. It's been talked well, about, but... Yeah, you know, a moratorium has been discussed, but now, of course, there is more call for it, right? Yeah. So both Doudna and, and and Zhang have called for a moratorium. Plus, the more you learn about these genetic disorders that can be easily fixed by a replacement gene or a knockout gene, the temptation to do this is just so of course. great, right? But why pick on this one? Why not pick on something like hemophilia or? Uh, you know, some uh, hemoglobinopathy, which would be pretty easy I think, compared to this. Well, and the, the surveys that have been done on this are that most people, most people view this approach much more favorably if you're talking about some debilitating inherited condition that a family could get rid of by this technology. Oh. Um, if you've proven it safe and effective in, in smaller scale in laboratory, you know, like laboratory animals and that kind of thing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but uh, but for something like this, the approval rating goes way down. <laughs> That's right. That's, and I mean, plus, it, it, what he's doing is he's just doing experiments on people. It's yes. right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Unlicensed, just unapproved. Period. That's, That's yeah. right. Experimenting on he people. Convince this is somebody that they, he was a great scientist. I can cure your daughters before they're born. I can make right. everything right. 
Just trust me. A, I'm a scientist. Un, trust me, I'm a scientist. It's unethical. And Kathy is absolutely right about that. Unethical. I mean, trust me, I'm a scientist. That, that's not going to go far. So Tony had just written a few hours ago, here's a question appropriate for the upcoming World AIDS Day. Does the panel agree it's appropriate for China to suspend her for violating medical, medical ethics for his use of CRISPR to genetic yes. engineer infants? Correct. I, I think it's I think it's appropriate to suspend him, investigate this, and if his claims are in fact true, then he should not be working in science anymore at the very minimum. All right, so now uh, that's good, but this is not going away anytime soon. And this no. is um, I hope they do put a moratorium in because uh, it we need to take this slowly. We have to, you know, there's so many dangers that let's do this the right way. And I just hope that no one else feels that they can just go cowboy and do these sorts of things because yeah. of this, right? We have some follow-up. And, uh, Kathy, can you take that first one, please? Uh, oops. Yes, this is the one from Nick. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nick writes, I just looked over the most recent TWIV and saw your citation of an article, Seeing the Moon Upside Down, in quotes, <laughs> when in the Southern Hemisphere. I only recently noticed during a birding trip to Guyana that the moon's crescent lay at the bottom of the moon as it set in the west. Mm -hmm. Here in the northern hemisphere, the crescent is on the moon's side. Mm -hmm. This is a result of the same phenomenon, but I was unaware until that trip near the equator a couple of years ago during a magic, clear, tropical, moonlit night in a small boat in the middle of a lake in southwestern Guyana mm -hmm. with monkeys calling from the shore and nighthawks flitting over the surface gleaming insects. Mm -hmm. This is about five degrees north of the equator. Of course, the crescent, the sunlit part of the moon, faces the sun as seen from the observer. And since the moon circles the earth over the equator, when we are near the equator, the moon follows a path from east to west directly overhead. So it is sinking in mm -hmm. the west. So as it is sinking in the west, the lower part of the moon is sunlit as it follows the setting sun. Whereas farther north or south, the moon is not seen from below, but from the side, as it lies above the equator. So we see the crescent on the right-hand side from the northern hemisphere, and on the left-hand side from the southern hemisphere. Fascinating. One learns about such simple phenomena at such a late age. <laughs> we virologists are curious about the world and are always learning new stuff, as shown by the links you guys provide. Keep up the good work with TWIV and ASV. And uh, Nick is uh, Nick Atchison, who's the, an emeritus professor now at McGill University. And I'm pretty sure he was the local host when the ASB meeting was there. But um, he and I have corresponded in the past also to see if uh, we are related because there's Atchison blood in my oh. side of the family tree, my part of the family tree. So, yeah. Yeah, I thought I found that interesting, too. I was listening to the episode as a like, wait. I hadn't <laughs> thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why our picks are so diverse, right? So if, yeah. if you're directly on the equator and you pull the plug in the sink that you've been washing your face yes, in. Yes, right, right. <laughs> Nothing happens? It just sits there. <laughs> it doesn't drain you. It goes straight yeah. down. I've actually had yeah. the... That's why I, the rainforests are there. Exactly right. Then there you go. There you go. Rob writes, Hi, Vincent. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders. I feel victim to many classic oh. <laughs> Mi Mixing up University College London, UCL, and Imperial College London. Mm. They are two different universities. The MSc course in Molecular Biology and Pathology of Viruses is at Imperial College, not UCL. Rob, from Imperial, not no. UCL. UCL. <laughs> All right. <laughs> He's right. I went back to the ad, and I wrote, yeah, uh -huh. university. I didn't – I guess I, I self – transposed it because the person who contacted me said Imperial College. Yes. So my apologies. Right. And if you decided not to investigate it because it wasn't at Imperial, now you can investigate it. <laughs> and you can go back a couple of twibs and find the link to that. That's a minor error. You know, it's like University of Michigan, Michigan State. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they're both almost. I wouldn't equivalent. make that. I wouldn't no, make that. Nobody, tip. nobody will mind. It's <laughs> right. Yeah, there, this, there are lots of things. At Notre Dame, we never made that mistake. I guess it's because of the College <laughs> London part, right? That's right. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Rich, were you at one of these two places? Uh, no. No, neither I, one. Uh, I was at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, which was an end at the time, at least. I don't know what its status is now. I think it still is an independent uh, entity. Okay. It's running got off the, it's, public funds. It's got the Imperial in it. Yeah. All right. All right, on to the literature. We have a snippet today. 
about uh, a DNA virus of Drosophila, Drosophila melanogaster, which um, is something new. They've, as we will see, there have been sequences of this virus, but never an infectious isolate. So there's some cool things about this. This was published in PLOS Pathogens. Isolation of a natural DNA virus of Drosophila melanogaster and characterization of host resistance and immune responses. Natural is a little funny to me to say a natural virus, right? William Palmer, Nathan Med, Philippa Beard, and Darren Obard from the University of Edinburgh. Pronounced correctly because I was corrected years ago on TWIV. I said it wrong. Someone said you're supposed to say it this way, and I got it. So and I, with few enough few enough authors with names we can pronounce so that you can actually read the whole authorship. Yes. That was a, just a, yet another classic blunder on Vincent's part. Yeah, I fell <laughs> victim to the classic blunder of saying Edinburgh instead of Edinburgh. Right. But I say it correctly now. When I was in Australia, uh-huh. they told me how to pronounce Melbourne, Melbourne. Uh-huh. and Geelong. And so uh, some things I do remember. Brisbane. 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 Cairns. There you go. Do you say Cairns? Cairns. Cairns. Waukesha. <laughs> Wagga Wagga. <laughs> uh, while we were correcting blunders, um, when Rich said that about <laughs> ICRF. Oh, we could go um, on for hours. <laughs> this whole show is um, about blunders. <laughs> uh, it, it merged in 2002 and is now part of Cancer Research UK. It okay. merged with the Cancer Research Campaign. Hmm. All right. Hmm. On to Drosophila melanogaster. Mm-hmm. Right, so this paper is William Palmer, Nathan Med, Philippa Beard, and Darren Auburn. <laughs> you already read it. <laughs> we should we should say, as an historical note, that organism was adopted first at Columbia University as the genetic organism. And Thomas Hunt Morgan yeah. decided to employ Drosophila melanogaster to investigate this genetic stuff that had been forgotten since Miles Mendel. Miles Sturdivant and uh, Dobshensky. And he said, um, I'm going to make some mutants. And he got the first... Drosophila mutant with, with a white eye. It was called white. And he didn't, he didn't do anything. He just bred until he got a white one. Exactly. Later on, he, he realized he could use x-rays or other things to induce mutagens. But he had this single white fly. And about the time his wife gave birth to their child, he went to visit her in the hospital. And she said, how's the white fly? Because <laughs> it was very sickly. And he was worried it wasn't going to live. <laughs> when I was looking up something about RNAi. I found a poster online that shows a pie chart where Drosophilids represent 0.3% of the total described insect species. 0.3%. <laughs> That's a lot. Papers actually. on Drosophilids uh. represent 71% of total papers <laughs> published in insect functional <laughs> genomics Roger from 1980 that. to 2007. Okay. So this poster is making a case for. Um, <laughs> The extraordinary diversity of insects and the poor representativity of Drosophila. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, Drosophila is great to work with because there's so many mutants available. Exactly. Yeah. And right. sequences exactly. And, and mutant resources and so forth. Well right. So the reason, the reason um, Morgan picked it was because it had these huge chromosomes in the salivary glands. Yes. Right. That's and right. with the tools of the day, that was important for tracking that's the right. genetics of it. That's right. And then it became the standard genetic model. And now you've got flies of all sorts and you've got all the mutants. And now we can look at the DNA as well. So these folks went to look for viruses. And this was not their first foray into this, right? So they, they actually had found – I looked up this, this reference because I was like, well, how did they do this? Um, so there's a PLOS biology paper from 2015 where they did the bulk of the survey right, work looking right. in, in had, natural populations. Sequences. So Drosophila is great for studying viruses because of the genetics, but they're mostly RNA viruses uh, like Drosophila C virus and cricket, and that's a Drosophila virus. But then there's a lot of other insect viruses that will infect Drosophila, but they're not naturally infecting Drosophila like cricket paralysis virus. I bet you can guess where that was from. <laughs> from the Jiminy Cricket Research yeah. Laboratory in hey, Disney World. <laughs> how about this one? Where do you think this was from? What kind of an insect? Flockhouse virus. Um, lice. Yeah, beetle. Oh, yeah. Beetle. How about Synbis virus? Synbis. Isn't that That's from a, a place? It's, it's a from place. A and then this one is something that Rich will like. Invertebrate iridescent virus number six. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From a moth. I don't know what that that came from. A moth. What did it come from? A moth. According okay. to this paper. By the way, for the for the lay public out there, Drosophila are fruit flies. Right. Fruit yes. flies. So when your yeah. fruits 
sitting out or, it, or right. in an outdoor fruit stand and they're these little teeny flies they're tiny. buzzing around. They're tiny. They are very, tiny. They're very cute. Couple, couple of millimeters. They're adorable. Okay. And, That's, and, and, they and are well, one of those. And I, in college, took a genetics course and we had to work with the, the fruit flies and with colored eyes and bent wings and stuff. Mm-hmm. That was very cool. The eyes, especially when you had different colors, they're really beautiful. Classic model organism. That's it. Classic model. And if you want to read more about its role in genetics and Thomas Hunt Morgan, you read uh, Time, Love, and Memory. Ah, uh, yeah. Very good. It's by pointing to his bookshelf. John, by. Uh, Jonathan <laughs> uh, Weiner from Columbia University. Pulitzer Prize winner. So here they said, let's find a DNA virus because um, there aren't any that. We don't have viruses. We could do a lot of cool experiments. And it, I am very sympathetic with the motivation <laughs> here because because not just DNA virus, but the notion of studying a matched uh, host pathogen pair. Right, right. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, putting viruses and hosts together that didn't grow up together mm-hmm. uh, for perfectly legitimate reasons that uh, it makes them easier to study in many cases. But – uh, you miss out on the fine tuning between the host uh, and the pathogen uh, in the uh, host trying to mount an immune response and the pathogen trying to uh, fight back with that uh, if you have a, a an unmatched pair. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic with the motivation here. What's the other word that you had chosen, Vincent, except for natural? This is a host-parasite relationship that actually belongs together. You, it's naturally occurring. Naturally, no, I know that, but you laughed at that. Well, naturalists, I, right. I understand, but they didn't. They could have said naturally occurring, but just natural sounds weird, like as opposed exactly. to human made, right? <laughs> Precise. Precise. So yeah. there is a word in parasitology for the. Is it autochthonous? Or that doesn't respond. That doesn't correspond to the individual animal. No, I'm right? trying to think of it too because you know. I think that's naturally occurring. It's their naturally occurring relationship. Yeah, I, I mean, it's correct in the title. It just sounds weird because of what I just said. Right. So the the sequencing uh, metagenomics of native wa- it could have been native. Okay. Yeah. Uh, has has identified viral double stranded DNA viral sequences in wild caught Drosophila, like Drosophila inubila. And Melanogaster and Simulans. These have all been wild caught, as opposed to all the Melanogaster strains in the laboratory, which are no longer wild, right? Exactly. And these include the one of today's paper, Calithia virus, KV, Esparto, Tomeloso. <laughs> and, and I the, believe Calithia virus is named for a suburb of Athens. Is that right? Huh. Very good. Because I looked up Calithia and I looked up the, uh, as I said, the previous paper, the 2015 paper, has the way they collected this, which was old-fashioned field biology. People went out and put fruit in, <laughs> you know, the outdoors and right. caught a bunch of flies and then they pureed the flies and sequenced them and, and then they looked for viruses and mm-hmm. um, that's where they found like two dozen mostly RNA viruses. And then the DNA virus from that is the one that they focus on in this paper. There are also sing, and, single-stranded DNA viruses. Go ahead, Kathy. Right. I, I was just going to say the the Calithia virus sample that they, or yeah, positive sample that they used was from Thika, Kenya. So it's, if you mean is a it, suburb of Athens, Greece, then. Um, is, <laughs> is this from, they say they, they looked at pools from five collections and then they list three locations, three of them. I don't know. Uh, just under yeah, the, Kenya. the it's Kenya. Yeah, it says oh, they, Kenya. Yes. Okay. So I see. Yeah. Selected a KV positive sample from Thika, Kenya. Got it. But they may have had them <clears throat> from other places as well, right. because it's the metagenomic sequencing that of this list of viruses that Vincent was just reading off. How these right. were all previously and identified. It's just and sequences. as we're going to hear, the KV virus is pretty widely distributed. Yeah. So KV is known to be a member of. Um, a family that is highly related to the brachoviruses, which we've talked about, these brechonid parasitoid wasps. They're envelope double-stranded DNA viruses, 120 to 230 kilobase pair DNA, double-stranded DNA genomes. And as um, someone just said, it's PCR surveys of wild flies show that KV is pretty widespread in melanogaster and simulans. Um, and so they, they said, let's get a real virus, 
Let's get infectious virus, not real virus, infectious yeah. virus, not just a DNA sequence. And now this is a theme that is continuing from an earlier TWIV where uh, sequences of viruses, one that comes to mind is a bat mumps virus that was put together and recovered. Then there was an Ebola-like virus um, was from a bat. They, they create make infectious virus to study. And so here they're going to do that. And they have wild-caught flies that are pcr positive for this viral sequence. They homogenize them and they look through and say which ones are PCR positive and then they clarify it by centrifugation and they micro-inject 50 nanoliters into flies that have a mutation in Dicer 2, which makes the antiviral response uh, not so good. And they wait a week and they, they homogenize 100 of those flies, and then they re-inject, and they do that twice more. And at the last stage, they injected 2,000 <laughs> of these flies to make their stock. They clarify it, and they end up actually purifying the virus by centrifugation. The question Now, is, if you do this with, with ferrets, somebody comes and shuts your lab down. This is all true. <laughs> Can you? Are there cell lines from Drosophila? Sure, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. Could they raise this virus up in cells? Uh, I don't remember if they did it, but they did uh, not. They did they not, did not because I was, I was, you know, that would be the easy Much way simpler. to do it. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, on the on the other hand, mm. you know, in my mind, the the even one passage of a virus in culture Changes carries everything. with it the danger of of, <laughs> yeah, of yeah. selecting yeah, for something. Yeah. So I would I would I like starting here. Okay, mm. uh, and then, but I, 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 I can't believe they didn't try and grow it so, uh, on cells in so culture. A, S two is a classic Drosophila cell line, and if you had been for here for Wednesday's seminar by Raul Andino, which was fabulous, he yes. uses S two as uh, well as flies. Uh, yeah. Okay, but oh, I, don't know if I know I made you forget because sure well, so, <laughs> let let me interject, and maybe you'll think in the meantime. <laughs> this paper is Impossible. in plus pathogens, which means it's open access, and it has an unusual structure for a modern virology yes. paper because it starts right after the introduction with materials and methods. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the ma- the gist of this paper is that they're telling us how they isolated this virus and tested it and did all these things, and it's. It's really fun to read that. And then there's a combined results and discussion section. So, so how, uh, go ahead. How does the Drosophila fly catch the virus? Well, we're going to get to that. Oh. They have some experiments. Yeah. Catch, is that the word you want to use? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because they don't get it by injection, I'm pretty sure. No, no they don't. They Unless don't. a mosquito gets we're gonna, it. To we're going to get to it. But that's a very good question. But, okay. Fine. So they, they did all this passage from fly to fly, and they... Um, they found other viruses in there, you know, RNA viruses. Um, so they had to use centrifugation to purify the, the DNA virus away. And they think they got rid of most of the contaminating RNA viruses, which they could then look at by electron microscopy and see that they are similar morphologically to other uh, nudie viruses. The Orocytes rhinoceros nudie virus, a well-known nudie virus, enveloped rod-shaped, 200 and nanometers or, or long. Orocytes rhinoceros, by the way. That's not a rhinoceros. It's a rhinoceros beetle. Ah. Appropriately named, too. Just look them up. Yes. You know, they're yeah. remarkable animals. 200 nanometers long, 50 nanometers wide. It reminds me of baculovirus. Right? Yes. Narrow is they, long. They're, they're, they're pretty closely related yeah. to baculovirus. Mr. 5 by 5 <laughs> So when you have a new virus, what do you do with it? Well, if it's me, you do growth curves, right? <laughs> Yep. So they injected it into Drosophila oregon, which is a strain of melanogaster, males and females, and they did it with and without Wolbachia. Uh-huh. And they measured virus. Because Wolbachia has been found to inhibit RNA virus replication in insects, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, sure. And they use, unfortunately, they use quantitative PCR. They don't have a plaque assay, I guess. <laughs> I have to say that you know, maybe they couldn't grow a lawn of flies. And all, all this, uh, all these individuals on this podcast will appreciate this. Had a, we had a recent uh, NIH grant review come back to us, and one of the comments was, "Why do you need to use plaque assays? Why can't you do ah. PCR?" <laughs> I, I, I said, 
this has got to be a joke because they know it's me and then yes oh my gosh it's, trolling you. it's not a joke when the other people are listening and they don't know anything about it and they they go along with this place. yeah you never know if it was spoken or written only anyway uh, so in females you get a big increase by day 10, 45,000 fold, and the titer goes down as DNA copies. In males, it's a little more slowly, sevenfold lower titer. Um, but neither, it, it didn't, uh, well, Baki didn't have any effect on virus growth in either males or females. And they're keeping track of which cells these go into, too, I bet. I haven't. Not them. really. They, no, don't they don't actually don't. take no. them apart. Really? So the, nope. next, the next thing is how is it spread? So a, a close. Well, they also looked at the the titer was lower in males, but the mortality was higher. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a lethal virus. Okay, right. So it's it's preferentially lethal to males. And is it a promiscuous virus? That is to say, does it infect other insects also besides Drosophila? It's a good question. I don't remember he, them ever talking about that. It's widespread in Drosophila, but I don't know about other insects. Because you know, think of the the Mediterranean fruit fly that caused a great deal of economic yeah. loss in California at one mm -hmm. point. If this virus was effective, there'd yeah. be a biological control. I think there are relatives in other insects. <clears throat> okay. Well, there's also they find. I guess we're going to get to this, but they find significant variation in its lethality in different strains of Drosophila. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, how is it spread, Dixon? Because as you said, it's not by needle, right? No. Um, so they fed it to the flies, whether it can be acquired through contaminated food. Mm -hmm. But it was very, they could get an infection, but it was very inefficient, they say. Um, and they could detect it in the feces. And um, so they, they say it probably can be transmitted fecally orally. Um, but there and may be other... And they're also basing that on other... Other insect yeah. viruses that How about are sexually that transmitted. They looked at that, um, but they didn't find evidence of it uh, in the right places. So it's that. an immaculate conception virus, then. <laughs> right? It's most well, not like not only that, but it uh, it one of its effects on females is to it doesn't actually make them sterile, but it decreases their fertility. Right? Right. Fecundity. Uh, fecundity. 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 Mm. Number of eggs. It's not Number clear if eggs. that's it. Also decreases their mobility. And do any of the offspring have it? I, I didn't look at that. They they would feed flies and then look for virus in the um, gonads. And they said uh, they found it in the ovaries, but it was high, much more enriched in the rest of the fly compared right. to the ovary. There's, right. a, there's a little there. They say explicit tests for transovarial or sexual transmission Are required. Um, haven't been done. They haven't. So right. it could mm -hmm. be transmitted vertically. And do these... And the, the, these insects have toe-like receptors, things for DNA mm -hmm, sure. interference <laughs> and all that stuff. So yeah, you, you'd they assume. Have, they have toe-like receptors yeah, and, and innate immunity. They also have RNA-based immunity. Right. Which is, I otherwise, got they wouldn't be here. <laughs> I got distracted by the assays for the virus uh, decreasing their mobility. Yes. Mm -hmm. They got these <laughs> machines with a bunch of yes. tubes and light that's sensors right. in them. That's and you right. stick that's the right. flies in them, and the light sensors can sense the the, the flies moving around yes. and, and record it. Sure, sure. Right. It's from a company called Trikinetics. It's the Drosophila Activity Monitor. And when you go to their webpage, they have uh, locomotor activity monitoring systems for biological research. Evidently for, uh, uh, let's see, flies, mosquitoes, bees, spiders, ants, cockroaches, beetles, and fish, among others. Right. Hmm. So they've got a whole niche of measuring animal <laughs> movement. Right, right. Niche or niche? Uh -huh. <laughs> I say niche. niche. <laughs> I like niche. I say potato. Do you say potato? <laughs> it's also a primer, right? A primer. Right. It That's is right. a primer. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. So we already said it's it's more lethal in males, um, and it causes uh, but a reduction in fecundity. Females, females, it causes they have increased lethargy resulting from infection, which may be the cause of the decreased fecundity, or may be because they're just unrelated. Of course, in nature, if you had Lethargy, lethargy, you would have probably be eaten very quickly. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, let's see. Decreased fecundity. They monitor the number of eggs yep. laid. Um, and so maybe they think that... Oh, so the, the they look in the ovaries and, and the infection uh, halts oogenesis around stage eight. Right. That's why it's not uh, vertically transmitted then, I guess. Yeah, but the, you make fewer eggs as a consequence but, of that. But the right. ones that are made are not infected, one would ex would yeah. suppose, because 
Otherwise, right. So it may, be, it may be the virus is doing something specific in the ovaries, or it may be that the immune response to the virus is just generally making the fly sick, so the ovaries are not operating normally. So you said the titer goes up and then it comes back down again. Yeah, like like a virus. No, infection. that's that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So what if you took what if you took chemolymph from the ones that recovered and gave it to naive Drosophila mm-hmm. and then tried to infect them? Yeah, it them. could have some RNA, small RNAs, which would be interfering. But Dixon, do you think that hemolymph would contain antibodies or T cells? They don't make either one of those things. Exactly. So therefore, I know a lot about exactly. insect immunity because let me, let I almost say, worked on that one. And I learned something else this week, which <laughs> yes. to me is very depressing. It's totally unrelated to this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Please do. <laughs> You and I, Dixon, yes. Rich Condit, and Kathy Spin, that we have no more thymus, and we have really very little bone marrow. You know what? That's okay. And we cannot make new T cells if I, we're infected. We only have memory T cells. Why would we want to? What do you mean, why would we want to? I feel like a shell of a human now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Amy was saying something about that before. I said, well, you know, come on. You're a lot younger than I am, so you could look ahead and say, at least I can live to my age if you'd like because I don't have any thymus left at all. There's yeah. there's some research that may be – it may be out already or it may be coming out soon that may <clears> – <throat> It may show that it's not all about bone marrow in making your <laughs> right your C your T cells. Well, the bone marrow, the T cells come from the thymus, right? Yeah. Right. The B cells from the bone marrow, but you know yeah. that may be why old people have a problem with vaccines, right? Like flu right. vaccine. Well, it's known it's known that as you age, your immune system becomes less. Active. Yeah, but I didn't realize my long bones had no marrow in them. It just bothers me like nothing. I got to tell you. <laughs> All right, back to the flies. <laughs> <laughs> right, Lord of the flies. <laughs> Lord of the flies. Um, what else do we have here? We have decreased fecundity. Oh, so then there's this cool d- Drosophila genetic resource where they have lots of mutants that you can get, and you can infect them. They're inbred lines, yeah. and so, yeah, you can do a really nice uh, GWAS type of genetics uh, yeah. where you identify host genes involved in susceptibility to the virus. Are there, any, are, there, are there any examples of Drosophila species that are parthenogenic? <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I wonder if there Not are. Not that I'm aware of. I don't know. Because that would automatically give you a genetic line, right? Because they're all genetically identical. I don't <laughs> think there's anything that easy with Drosophila. Okay. But they're easy to breed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they they do this and they find some genes that seem to be involved in pathogenesis to some extent um they really need to do more work here i didn't find anything i wanted to talk about unless someone else no it was it looked like a bunch of promising leads yeah promising leads will work on it and which i think was the whole point was you know we we looked at the immune response and here it is and and the the promising leads they could pretty much always tie to some virus or other right um that's right so receptor tyrosine kinase uh, gene involved that was regulates chikungunya virus replication in humans, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And to, together with that, they looked at transcriptional profiling of the infected flies to see what genes go up and what go down, and a few of them correlate with the GWAS results. So they they have a lot more work to do. But that's uh, that's basically the story. I think it's cool because it's the first natural <laughs> virus DNA virus of Drosophila or native, yeah, native, <laughs> native. That's good. They did find uh, striking but variable upregulation of eleven of the twenty-four Tweedle genes. Oh, Tweedle, that's right. Yes, that's the great. Tweedle genes regulate body shape. <laughs> tweedle ah, genes are with a capital cool. T as yeah, well. Of course, yeah. Drosophila. They have great names for their yes. genes. Yes. Do beetles uh, so have tweedles? Do beetles have tweedles? I would assume so. Sure, why not? <laughs> do wibbles have wobbles? <laughs> and so I, that, the, the method's interesting. The uh, Now you have a resource to work on a DNA virus. And Rich Cond, it's coming out of retirement. Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I don't know that we mentioned this, but uh, it, the genome had been uh, previously sequenced in a metagenomics uh, study, and it's like 155 kilobases. The virus genome, I'll, yeah. Yeah. A lot of these things are circular. I didn't see any reference to whether this was or not, but at any rate, it's big. So some people would say, oh, I have the viral genome sequence. Let me just synthesize it and throw it into cells. Piece of cake. And uh, you could, as we talked about for the horsepox virus, which was recovered from synthetic 
oligonucleotides. I'm amazed at the length of oligonucleotides you can have synthesized now. Yeah. It's remarkable. So you could do that with this, but uh, this is the natural way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And the, the whole point of the paper was this back to nature approach. The, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's find a virus that actually circulates in these flies in the wild and <clears throat> then bring it into the lab. But when we bring it into the lab, we're going to propagate it initially by passaging it through flies. So it's going through something like a natural cycle and then look at the uh, the normal transmission mechanism and see what's going on. Yeah, this, this is, is what I need to do for the planaria coronavirus. It's the natural virus. Natural, there you go. Natural history of the virus. I have and to get small needles so I can inject them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the the cool thing is that they went after this so that they could find a DNA virus and they've already found a difference from RNA viruses in right. that the underlying genetic architecture of variation is unlike what's in RNA viruses, in which a high proportion of variation was apparently determined by a small number of loci. Mm -hmm. so, right. And so they found the difference worthwhile. with Wolbachia. Yeah. Yeah, mm. good point. And they found the Tweedle gene upregulation. Right. Yes, which is just great. <laughs> Tweedle, which is Tweedle way cool. Tweedle dumb. All right, on to our paper. This is a paper in Nature Microbiology, just published and it is an upstream protein coding region in enteroviruses modulates virus infection in gut epithelial cells. I must say I picked this because it's right up my alley. Yes. And as you will see, it's kind of the story that we started in the 80s in a way. Yeah. And this is um, from the University of Cambridge and the University of Leeds. We have uh, Lula, Dinan, Hosmilo, Chaudhry, Sherry, Irigoyen, Nyack, Stonehouse, Zilbauer, Goodfellow, and Firth are the authors. Sort of rolls off the tip of your tongue, of as course. you just said. So, <laughs> uh, picornavirus is, yes. And they're, they're in Cambridge. They're in Cambridge. Cambridge and Leeds. Cambridge and Leeds. 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 Live at Leeds. That's Cambridge, England, by the way. Live at Leeds. <laughs> right, so University Live of Cambridge, University of Leeds. That was, a, that was a Who album. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Do you know who the Who was? Who? Who's on first? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so the coronaviruses uh, are the family of viruses on which I've spent most of my career. Alan Dove did his thesis on a coronavirus yep. called poliovirus. I've heard of that. And uh, there are many other picornas. In fact, now there are over 40 genera. When I started working wow. in the... Um, in the 80s, there were four genera of coronaviruses, but then as people sequenced samples, metagenomic samples, they got to be more and more and more. There are just many, many of all sorts of life forms on Earth. Mm. But the characteristic, and one of these is the enterovirus genus, and that's the genus with poliovirus and rhinoviruses and Coxsackie and entero D68, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they have a long open reading frame on this 7.5 kilobase plus stranded RNA. Now, when I was a postdoc, I sequenced the genome and found this single long open reading frame. And it proved what people had thought for a number of years, that the protein is expressed as a single polyprotein. And using so, other techniques, yes, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to ask you to expand on how it was known before the sequence or how it was thought to be right. one long polyprotein. What's the evidence? So people were infecting cells with the virus and they would, Add labeled amino acids or look at the proteins on gels. And there was some evidence that there were um, proteins that were bigger than the, the individual right. final proteins. And then people started adding inhibitors of proteolysis into these experiments and they got long precursor proteins. And I think Don Summers was the one who proposed that there was a long protein made and there was good biochemical evidence for that. And then when we sequenced it, we could see this long open reading frame. The mm -hmm. classic experiment was a UV radiation experiment, right? Where they looked at that was one of the, the yeah, yeah. Where they looked at uh, the effect of UV dose on the synthesis of the individual proteins or something right. like that. That was yeah. Where you, where if they if they were all uh, uh, made as independent genes, then they would. Uh, disappear after UV according to their uh, intrinsic size, but that he, didn't happen. Yeah, he's thinking of VSV, he's thinking isn't of the he? VSV, oh, yeah, yeah VSV, the fallen okay. white paper. Yeah. Okay, I was thinking of VSV. That's a You're classic right. paper that we did. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I'm thinking of pactomycin, which is an inhi- a ribosomal yes. inhibitor. That was that add. was that was Dave Rikosh. Dave, Dave Rikosh. That's right. Dave Rikosh. Right. So you could stop the ribosome at various points, and you got the protein of that size. Yes. Indicating that it was just translating straight through. Right. So you got ladders of proteins, or various sizes of proteins, depending on when you added the inhibitor. More like right. stools. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I mean, the kind that you stand on. <laughs> oh, so we saw oh, oh, this long yes. open reading frame, but there was a five prime non coding region of about 740 bases, and it had seven AUG codons in it, right? Now, at the time, this is 1980. The dominant hypothesis is that ribosomes bind a five prime cap. They scan and they find the first AUG codon. And so, the find- AUG codon is the initiator codon for making Start the protein. Codon. All right, the star code. So having upstream AUGs, oh, there was her heresy. How, how could this be? And eventually this upstream, this non-coding region was shown to be an internal ribosome entry site, which mediates translation in a different way from all the messages that cells have in that the ribosomes can bind internally. They don't need to bind to the five prime end. So that's, oh, okay, maybe these AUGs are not so much of a Which problem. is also important for polio um, because the genome doesn't have a five prime methyl cap. Right, and and uh, the virus also one of the proteases shuts off host cap dependent translation, so right. it will make sense. Now, in the early days, we we had so we'd sequenced polio virus. I came here to Columbia, and one of my first postdocs, Gerardo Kaplan, uh, started looking at these AUG codons. We collaborated with Nahum Sonnenberg's group, so they introduced mutations at each of these seven AUG codons. And Gerardo, my lab, built them into an infectious clone, and we asked, um, what were they doing? And for every, each one of the seven, we got infectious virus out. So changing the AUG to a T, a UUG, didn't matter for infectivity. And we left it at that. We published a paper, and that was 1988. Now, here we are, two th- what is this year? 2018. 2018, yeah. so 30 years later. 30 years later. They note that... You discover that you missed something. I, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we'll get back to that. In fact, Amy sent me this paper earlier in the week, and she, said, she wrote in the email, did you and Sonnenberg miss this? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so they look, and there's, in poliovirus type 1, there's a little open reading frame following the sixth AUG codon, all right? And and it overlaps the main polyprotein open reading frame. And and an open reading frame, just for folks who aren't versed in this, this is just a sequence that could be translated. That's right. In principle. So they're thinking, "Eh, maybe this is interesting. And so now we have thousands of enterovirus sequences available, whereas back then we had one. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Two. And they look at them and they say, oh, you know, this is pretty conserved. Uh, this upstream open reading frame is not in every enterovirus. So it's not in rhinoviruses and other enteroviruses that cause respiratory infections, but it's in others. So they say, let's see if this is real, if there's a protein made and what it's doing. And that's what this paper is about. And the, the protein that would be made is about 56 to 76 amino acids in length. So it's not huge. And it has, a, quite small. it has a protect a predicted transmembrane sequence. So it could even be a, a membranous protein. So when you have 3,000 sequences, one thing you can do, if you don't want to do wet experiments, <laughs> you could sit down at your computer and ask, is this sequence subject to purifying selection at the amino acid level? Right. And to do that, you look at the ratio of the non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions. So the virus mutates randomly. Do some of those, at, at what rate do those cause substitutions that would change an amino acid mm-hmm. and compared to the rate at which they make substitutions that would not change an amino acid? Right. So if the protein is important, you would you would predict not a lot of amino acid changes. Right. right. Especially with one so small. Exactly. So they find that, in fact, the, the, the ratio is quite low, which suggests that this is a, a real protein. Okay, so then they say, let's do some genetics. So they do this. So, uh, hang on, before go. you get there, the, they uh, they looked at, what, 3,000 right. sequences. Yeah. Correct. And they present a phylogenetic tree mm-hmm. of where these show up and where they don't. And uh, I, I don't know enough about enteroviruses to make 
sense out of this biologically, except it is clear from the tree that there are clusters, mm-hmm. biogenetically yes. related clusters of viruses that make this and other clusters that don't. Correct. And uh, I'll just put the question out there, and maybe we can come back to it, as to whether there's anything about the biology of the viruses in these clusters that uh, makes sense in terms of what this protein could be doing. Well, there's at least one thing that jumps out with the rhinoviruses versus the most of the enteroviruses. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll get to that. So respiratory versus Respiratory versus intestinal. So so Entero-C has the polio and some of the Coxsackies. Okay. Entero-D is, entro, for example, enterovirus D68, which we work on, and this is a respiratory virus. It infects the respiratory tract. doesn't have mm-hmm. this little okay. open reading frame. As and enterovirus C, 46.2% yeah. of them have this. But this causes this paralysis. And enterovirus D, right? 0% of them do. Yeah, yeah entero D68 does cause paralysis. So, I mean, obviously not all of them have it, but as you will see, I, I think you'll be convinced that this is a protein that's doing something. So it's mm-hmm. clearly something related to what cells are infected. I and some of the other groups, like 90, 90 to, in one case, 100%, have, mm-hmm. the, have this open reading. So frame. this this virus that par- par- paralyzes has to be in other places besides the lungs, right? Yeah, of course. So Well, it's got to get to the neurons. Well, that's the, right? the point. That's the point. Yeah. So let's uh, go on here. They, they take their an infectious clone of Echovirus 7, which they probably just had in the lab, sure. and that's why they're using it. And they change, um, they, they introduce premature termination codons uh, into this little open reading frame. And in a cell line that they use, rhabdomyosarcoma cell line, RD, these, mm-hmm. these viruses replicate just fine. And, um, you know, we, <laughs> this is the same codon that we mutated in 1988. Mm-hmm. And as I said, we 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 could get virus out of that particular change. Although the plaques produced by that virus, I went back to the 1988 paper. The plaques are smaller, and the growth curve is is delayed compared to wild type virus. So there's some phenotype when we altered this particular AOG codon in polio in polio virus. That's polio, right. Right. And I'll tell you later which polio because that makes a difference. Yes. <laughs> which specific polio virus? Um, now, so they note that this AUG number seven is in a stem loop. Um, so when they change the AUG, they also change the other side of the loop so they don't break up the base pairing of the loop. Yet um, this change still decreases the internal initiation activity of this particular sequence. And, so that uh, virus is sick. So it is sick because it, um, it reverts. When you do change the AUG, you do have a sick virus, and it reverts very quickly. So they don't actually use that. So the, the real question is whether the protein is made. And they basically can either tag the protein or they can they make an antibody against it, infect cells with the virus, do Western blots, and they can see the protein is actually made. It's quite convincing it's the right size with, the, with antibody detection. Uh, and they also do ribosome profiling, which is really remarkable where you can, and this is a, pro, a procedure called riboseq, which is cool. You, you, you take translating polysomes from cells and you digest them with ribonuclease and you ask what sequences are protected by the ribosomes. And, and Rich, when you look this up, this is a modern day ad- adaptation of what Joan Stites originally Yep. developed, right? Because now we use next generation sequencing because we could say exactly what sequences are protected by the ribosome. Yep. She originally I, just passed away, right? Yes, yes, he did. Um, so you can you can sequence and say what are the ribosome protected fragments and they see, you know, there's the for for, for this echo virus you have the polyprotein AUG and this upstream AUG are the two main ribosome protected fragments. So it's clearly being translated. And, and echo seven, and they also look at poliovirus type one and enterovirus A seventy one. And A seventy one, of course, is an enterovirus A. So we go A through right. many letters. Yes, <laughs> all twenty six. <laughs> As I said earlier, this um, we may this, have to add some more letters at some <laughs> point. This upstream, they call this protein up UP. I guess it stands for upstream protein. Yeah, and it has a transmembrane domain. 
and they do the same ribosomal profiling with poliovirus. So poliovirus makes this protein uh, as well. As and those. they do it with poliovirus 1. They do polio one. 1. So that's really important. So they, they look at um, the effect of changing this, uh, these, this protein in different cells. And they don't have any. They don't have any issues in a variety of cell cultures that they test. Um, so, they, uh, they, but the viruses didn't evolve to grow in cells. They didn't grow in cells. <laughs> right. so in other they, words, the wild type and the mutant viruses grow the same in cells yes. in culture in the lab. Cells in yeah, culture. there's a whole bunch of cells, including I'll tell you this: HeLa cells. Yes. All right, because that's what we used in 1988. So they said, "What about in the gut? Because that's where a lot of these viruses initiate replication." So they make human intestinal epithelial organoid cultures where you take, uh, you take bits of mucosal biopsies from patients, you establish three-dimensional cultures, and then they trypsinize them and make monolayers out of them, which, which, which differentiate into nice models, which are called organoids. And then they can infect these. So this is like a miniature copy of that patient's gut. <laughs> That's right. And we... We've talked about this in the context of neuroviruses before, yeah. right? In- yeah, the paper that they reference, in fact, for making these is that neurovirus paper. Yeah. And this is this is what you do when, uh, obviously, when you don't have a cell culture model, but in this case, they're doing it because they want one that's closer to the, right. the normal environment. In those cells, there's a big effect of premature introducing a termination codon in this open reading right. frame. So whereas it had minimal effect in these other cell lines, in these, you know, organoid cultures, it's a big deal. It makes a big difference. And so they're, they're saying, well, this, you know, must have some role in the, in the initial cells of infection. Mm-hmm. And then they ask, well, what is this doing? What is this protein doing? And so they're thinking, well, it has a transmembrane domain. Maybe it has something to do with uh, virus release from membranes. And, you know, we talked, was it last week? the week before about how maybe last week so many for many viruses it's being recognized that they not infect cells not singly but in, in yeah that was clump. that was last week yeah that was last week and in some coronaviruses they're actually released in in vesicles so they're thinking maybe this is in, involved so they they treat um their infected cell samples with a detergent that would break up these members and that increases the titers. So this is the virus mutants right. that don't make this protein. They can increase the titer by treating the extracts with the and detergent. It increases the titer in the organoids that were infected with the mutant virus, but not in the organoids that were infected with the wild type virus. That's right. That's right. So you're apparently releasing virus that was stuck somewhere in the mutant right. virus. So the implication would be that the Protein ordinarily prevents that stickage, right? right. As if, uh, uh, I mean, one model would be that these viruses are in clusters bounded somehow by membranes. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't have the protein, and if you do have the protein, that's disrupted. It could be, right? yes, exactly. Which which would make sense. It's got a transmembrane domain, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's what they say. They think it's involved in release of virus particles from membranous compartments. And they mm-hmm. actually look in, in infected cells and they stain for the protein. They can see it's associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, so it's membrane-associated. Um, and they have some other membrane flotation assays where they can right. look at the ratio of virus and membrane and, and free fractions. And they can see the virus is membrane-associated and that this this protein plays a role in getting it out. One of the cool experiments is that they can show that if you add a neutralizing antibody to the virus, it doesn't work well unless you either have this protein or you treat the vesicles with a detergent because they're protected by the membrane from antibody neutralization. I think that's basically the story. So I'm convinced that this protein is made and that it's a transmembrane protein. So it's a small open reading frame that overlaps the main polyprotein open reading frame and that's a big yeah. deal because um this has been around for since 1980 and you know as they say for 50 years we thought there was one polyprotein open reading frame now we have something else right um so to rich's um earlier question <clears throat> you've got this going on this this up protein is in the gut enteroviruses it's not 
in the rhinoviruses, which are respiratory. It's not in the, in say, enterovirus D68, I guess, which, mm-hmm. you know, is, is respiratory. Yep. Um, so this appears to be a gut-specific adaptation yeah. that gets the virus out of some sort of a membrane stickage, as you put it, um, in the gut epithelium. And then the remaining question is, why are there some intestinal viruses that don't have it? And they, they have some speculation about that. Maybe there's some other bypass mechanism those viruses mm-hmm. are using. Um, but that is an interesting question. How There are clearly some intestinal enteroviruses that are getting along without this. Yeah. Uh, what are they doing? Now, uh, it would be nice if you could have an animal model that you could feed the virus to sure. and see the effect of having this. Unfortunately... So tr- we have transgenic polio receptor mice, but they're not orally susceptible no. unless you remove the type 1 interferon receptor. In that case, you can feed it to them, but I'm not sure if that's a great way to assess this, but right. that will probably be done. So are there any mouse enteroviruses? I'm looking for a paired, uh, a host pathogen pair. <laughs> uh, there must question. be mouse, and en- it must be mouse enteroviruses, but maybe they don't have a phenotype that you can deal with. Well, they're not. Enteroviruses. There are other picornaviruses of mice, but this is mm-hmm. something they found in enteroviruses, right? Mm. So, yeah, I'm not aware, but I, I'm sure in, if you looked in metagenomic data sets, you could find enteroviruses of mice, but sequences, and then you'd have to get the virus. And this right. is something we wanted to do years ago with rhinovirus because we couldn't make a mouse model for a rhino using the uh, making them transgenic for the rhinovirus receptor. So we started looking for rhinoviruses of wild mice. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I have 50 trachea of wild mice in our freezer <laughs> waiting to be sequenced, but um, we, we have to wait to get more money to do that. <laughs> so so you're just holding your breath on that. We're holding our breath. Now, let me let me wrap this story in a different way. So, of course, when I look at this paper, I go, what the hell did we do? Why didn't we pick this up in 1988? Okay, so I go back to the paper. Well, you were in cell culture. You were using a different virus. Oh, the different virus is the key. Yeah. So we we changed seven. All this seventh AUG. We had a small plaque phenotype. It was growing slowly. We we found that it was affecting internal ribosome entry, and we said, you know, this change must be affecting ribosome binding in some way. And the reason is that the open reading frame in type 2 poliovirus, which is what we did these experiments with, is much shorter. It doesn't even overlap the main open reading frame. And so that's... It's, it's 38 amino acids compared to whatever we said, 56 yes. to 70-something, right? right? Right. And I wrote a blog post yesterday where I made a picture of that, and you can see it. And so we didn't think it was anything, because upstream at the other six AUGs, they're also short open reading frames, right? And... So we said, yeah, there's nothing here. Nobody was interested in following it up. If we had done this in type 1, it would be longer and overlapping. Maybe we would have done something. But, you know, even then. You didn't have a organoids. Back in anything the 80s. Less than, yeah, anything less than a couple of hundred amino nobody, acids is kind of, eh. Now, this whole idea know? of upstream open reading frames. Subsequently, in CMV, Adam Gabal and others found that there are short open reading frames that are important for the virus. But that came after we were we were doing this, and maybe that would have alerted us to it. But there was no context for looking at a short peptide right up there. So we right. we just let it go. And uh, the reason we did type 2, by the way, is because that virus can infect mice, but you have to inject it right into their brains. And we thought any mutants we made, we could stick in mice and, and see them. But, it, you know, so that's why we missed it. <laughs> we thought it was so, too short. <clears throat> Yeah. So, so I have a question because they kind of address this in the uh, discussion. Uh, they say the majority of poliovirus type two and three sequences have only a truncated UORF mode lengths of thirty eight and eighteen codons, respectively, mm. too short to meet our definition of UORF mm. presence. <laughs> but that I mean, it seems a little arbitrary, and no, yeah, no, I'm, totally. and I'm wondering if. Uh, you know, the transmembrane domains that they have pictured here are 24 and 25 amino acids long. Okay. So, um, you know, maybe there's some of that around. Anyway, and then they say most available sequences, 203 of 229 of poliovirus 1, have an intact, intact UORF. So what about the 26 that don't? Right. <laughs> 
you know, mm. I, yeah, I know that's a, that's a little weird, questions. isn't it? That's a little yeah. weird because I want more explanation. <laughs> yeah, if it's so yeah. important, you would think all well, the type ones would have it. Now, the type yeah. two does have a transmembrane. Oh, it does. Okay, but. It's just but, short. Uh, you know, we did our experiments in HeLa cells where there's no phenotype, and they, they found the same things. We did not look in organoids because there weren't any. We could do that now, and that would be really interesting to look at that. Um, but, yes, the idea that some polio 1 have it and others don't, that's weird. Right. It doesn't make any sense to me um, if it's such an important thing. Um, and I don't know why being the most common serotype has anything to do with anything here yeah right? I mean, sure it makes it just makes me wonder whether there's sequencing errors you know because yeah. if they had had a sequencing error in the in the polyprotein they <laughs> would have gone back and looked to figure out that oh that's a sequencing error but i, I don't know i'm just hand waving why there's 26 poliovirus one sequences that they claim don't have the uarf yeah yeah I, I don't know. It's it's a bit weird. I mean, their data are clear, right? It mm-hmm. looks pretty good for for the yeah. Echo and the Polio One and and the other, but it's it's not in a lot of others. I'm just not sure what's going on. So well, there's there's clearly a lot more that needs to be done here. Yeah. Um, but as they say, you know, this this overturns the dogma that there was a <laughs> single big polyprotein and that was the source of all the proteins. What is it they say about dogmas? They're made to um, be... My, my karma ran over it? Yeah. Dog <laughs> or ran over your dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. All right. So I want to I wanna uh, flip out over one little mm. figure here for a second. This is 5B. It's the growth uh, curve on differentiated monolayers mm-hmm. comparing the wild-type virus and uh, two EV7 mutants in the protein. First of all, I want to note that they're doing plaque assays. Right. Right. All right. Uh, second, I want to note that it's a classic growth curve with a little eclipse phase where the virus mm-hmm. goes away yeah. Yeah. and then comes back, and I find that very satisfying. And But then the reason I wanted to talk about this is that after 25 hours, the titers in these cultures decrease. Mm-hmm. And what that means is that virus is actually going away. Correct. Somehow. Right. And in fact, that's where most of the difference is. Mm -hmm. The virus is going away faster in the mutants than in the wild type. In the peaks, there's no statistical difference. And it's not quite as exaggerated, but I think the same general phenomenon is true in patient two. Okay? So that makes me wonder if there's a difference in stability somehow of the viruses, or this could be due to the plaque assay measuring clusters of viruses versus unclustered virus or something like that. But it left me wondering about that. And it also left me thinking, I wish they had purified the virus and looked for this protein in the virions. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's encapsidated. Mm. And I can see it encapsidated and maybe the little transmembrane thing kind of sticking out or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's unlikely it's in the in the capsid, but it could be some effect on membranous vesicles, right? It's yeah. made in low enough amounts so that it would wind up relative, you know, probably only present in, say, one copy for virion or something like that. Yeah, that'd be hard to pick up, right? Mm-hmm. Mass spec. Right. All right, that's, a, uh, that's what I call the lost ORF. Yes. What is it? Something of the lost uh, ORF. Raiders. Raiders, Raiders of the Lost, lost Orf. Ooh, yeah. geez. Uh, that's title there. Uh, Raiders of the Lost. Well, it's not Raider. It's something else of the Lost Orf. Not a Raider, but yeah. Readers. 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 Of the lost readers. Orf. Right, right. I was reading that. <laughs> readers of the Lost. There you go. Put it in there. Okay, let's do a couple of email. First one is from Rob. Hi, Twivers. I wanted to send a follow-up to address your skepticism about the efficacy of acyclovir in blocking Alzheimer plaque formation, TWIV519. First, one oddity of herpes replication is that after reactivation from latency, the viral late genes, including its glycoproteins, can only be transcribed from replicated viral DNA. The evidence for this is good for gamma and beta herpes viruses, less so for alphas, where there are no really reliable latency reactivation models. Second, acyclovir inhibits all herpes viruses. They all make a thymidine kinase, an early gene product that will activate the molecule. 
Third, at least some cases of herpes simplex virus encephalitis are caused by lack of innate immune signaling, for example, TLR3 or TRAF3 mutations. So maybe for most of us who don't have defects in innate control of herpes viruses, injecting HSV into the brain would not cause HSV encephalitis. Remember my sly? So to my mind, it's entirely logical that occasional HSV particles or other herpes viruses, HHV6 or 7 or varicella zoster, could stray into the brain without causing disease. Then if beta amyloid becoming fibrillar is an innate response to having herpes virus glycoproteins capsids floating around, and the implication of the Brakefield paper, it is entirely logical that acyclovir, which prevents late gene expression by all herpes viruses, would reduce or prevent that from happening, regardless of whether HSV or HHV67 is causative. So I think it's plausible. Um, all the clinicians I've spoken to have said, if you have herpes in your brain, you're toast. So I'm not sure a little bit can sneak in. I don't think you, I think the people with these uh, toll like receptor mutations are predisposed to encephalitis, but that doesn't mean that it would not happen in others. Um, so this is this is interesting. If I read this correctly, he's is he suggesting that the effect of acyclovir could be on uh, virus replication outside the brain, preventing these guys from straying into the brain? Because we've we've you know been focusing on uh, uh, the idea hmm. that the virus is replicating in the brain, and uh, that's what uh, triggers the yeah, maybe he is yeah. uh, deposits. Maybe he is, but he's talking and, and, about how reactivation requires DNA replication, which would involve TK. Acyclovir would tar would target that. That's why I thought it was in the brain. But you're right; it could be outside the brain as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a different different yeah. take on this whole yeah. thing that I hadn't considered before. I think right. we had an we had an email the, the episode after five twenty, which I like where. You know, if you get a little TK expression in the absence of infectious virus, that will activate a cyclovir, right? And that could inhibit other synthetic processes in some way, mm -hmm. right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, that right. Was, I think that could that would basically be uh, for the cells bearing the TK. It would be cytotoxic. Yeah. 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 Okay. And that could thwart whatever's going on. Sure. Why not? Sure. <clears throat> They're working on I'm it. I'm still skeptical. Ditto. <laughs> um, Alan, could you take the next one? Sure. Jake writes, hello, Twivsters. Ever since my first listen and email, I've listened to Twiv, Twip, Twim, and Bacteriophiles on a daily basis with a rotation of each every four days. It would be safe to say I'm addicted. After hearing your Twim and reading the paper, I have to... Um, Say I, I have to say you've changed my view on the fundamentals of the paper, but I'm still critical on its coverage. However, the findings of the paper are interesting indeed. Keep up the good work and making my daily commutes more enjoyable. Oh, and how could I forget? It's murky 11 degrees C overcast in Newcastle, UK. I don't know what paper this is. For sure. <laughs> this is the effect of Roundup on honeybees. Ah, okay. Someone he'd written and said he thought it was terrible. And, I, and he said, well, we talked about it on Twim. Go listen. So I guess. Okay. He was convinced. Or, mm. uh, there were some issues with the paper, but they were not as bad as some people were making, I, I think. Dixon, can you take the next one? It's an easy one, too. Anthony writes, too despicable not to be true? I don't know. And it's a reference to a roundtable discussion of the intellectualists. And oh, my God. They're arguing that we don't have to get vaccinated because Jesus Christ was vaccinated against the flu. Yes, this is a televangelist who says... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus himself gave us the flu shot. Ta-da! So, so a, 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 actually, end of the discussion title here. <laughs> the title here, Jesus was, did you listen to this? No. No, no. It's pretty amazing. No. The title here is uh, slightly misrepresents it. The title says, Jesus was vaccinated. No, that's not what she actually says. What she says was that Jesus, in effect, vaccinated us, right? Because he got flu. Ah. Uh, Right. Uh, well, no, yeah, okay. He, no, he bore our sicknesses and it, carried there our you diseases. Go. But there he, you yeah, because there was no flu vaccine back so then. So it all should be That's gone right. now, then, unless you're not Christian, of course. Uh, <laughs> so, at any rate, so, right. So, so I just that's wonder. The, that's the argument. I just wonder. So does she 
actually believe this or, you know, in her religious fervor. Oh, my gosh. The whole discussion of whether televangelists believe what they're saying. That's another thing. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, on. we don't pass on vaccine effects for vertically, right? So, no. So, wait a minute. No, no, I know what it was. No, there's no, 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 no factual no, no. basis. Don't you know what the name of that, the, the drug was? It wasn't a vaccine. It was a drug. It was Tamiflu. Yes. Mm. Okay. <laughs> no, Tammy. You don't remember Tammy? Yes. Okay, forget it. Rich, can you take the next one? Uh, okay, hang on. Jessica, the last one. Yeah, I just, I'm really distracted by this. <laughs> I listened to her rap. She's, she doesn't actually, to me, sound entirely sober. But at any rate. <laughs> Jessica writes, Hi, TWIV team. Because I have a, a equal passion for social justice and science, I want to offer a, a couple of books that changed my perspective on some of my scientific heroes. I don't think I've heard these books mentioned on the podcast before, but the recent discussion of historical figures and early explorers brought this to mind. While I think it's important to value their contributions, I learned through these books that many of the scientists I always placed on pedestals and listed among my personal faves, as I guess I should be uh, surprised to find out, often maintained or promoted terrible positions on social issues. For example, I learned from first reading Inferior by Angelina Sinai. And Sinai. Sinai. Saini, S-A-I-N-I, that Charles Darwin used his theories and scientific knowledge to make a case for the inferiority of women, as did many other prominent scientists. I learned from reading Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi that ancient Greek philosophers who essentially developed a modern education system and scientists like Boyle, Darwin, Linnaeus, etc. used their above average intelligence to publicly argue the case for racism, slavery, and oppression of black and brown people around the world. Perhaps more obvious, the founding fathers of the U.S., who are still largely honored as great thinkers men, followed suit, including Lincoln. Many of the early explorers uh, were enabled to do their explanation, exploration and colonization of distant lands thanks to these philosophical doctrines about who is superior and inferior around the globe. Uh, yeah, just an aside here, and that whole uh, this was promoted, among other things, by my picking James Cook voyage around the world. It, it is remarkable that these guys went out and— uh, I would I would tell my wife about how, you know, he discovered this and discovered that. And she said, no, wait a minute. Yeah. Weren't there are people living Weren't there. there are people there. Yes. <laughs> Correct. They discovered him. You know, they went around. <laughs> they went around and planted the, you know, you find a piece of land, plant a flag and said, this belongs to England. Amazing. Exactly. While it's jarring to disrupt the romantic illusion that these great pioneers were also co-signers or creators of modern racism and oppression, it feels better, at least to me, to discontinue believing in the lie. As one who has always studied and worked in science, I found it interesting to read historical accounts and observations through the lens of the marginalized because it made me realize how much spin has been applied to even my beloved discipline. Again, I don't think being a jerk means scientists like Darwin shouldn't be acknowledged as paving the way for important ideas, but I don't believe they should be placed on pedestals either. I also think learning, learning this has broadened my perspective even further by making me question some of the opinions I've held in such high esteem for so long. For example, hard science is superior to soft science, etc., there's a whole gender bias associated with how we do science, and as long as we ignore it and ignore the stories of the non-victors, histories written by the victors, we limit our ability to fully understand and appreciate the world. I respect your openness, intellect, and thoughtful discussions, which is why I thought this might be of interest to all of you. Uh, thank you, as always. Jess. Very thoughtful letter. I like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's good. And this is a good example of why you should trust science and not scientists. Yeah. Totally. Yes. You know, they, there you these go. people, these people you mentioned contributed great work to the world. And yeah, yet yeah. they were also people yeah. who had yeah. their own flaws. And, and it's important to acknowledge that. That's <clears throat> yeah, totally. Unfortunately, the science, you're, the history you're taught 
at a very young age turns out not to be all true, right? Right. I mean, I just remember re- learning things many years later, and I thought, why did they tell me this in, in <laughs> don't, don't, you, don't you remember how shallow your education really was, though? Because it was. this was the, like the executive summary of the executive summary of yeah. the executive summary. It's, yeah. it's simpl- simplify everything down to just a few Precisely. easily memorable points, and, Precisely. and you gloss over all the ugly parts. You got it all right. I mean, it's just recently coming out about Thomas Jefferson, for instance, and how much of a rat he was in terms of racism. And well, his, recently being more widely no, it, acknowledged. That's what there I were meant. Pe- that's there what were I mean. people who knew sure, all sure, this sure, time. Sure, sure, sure. Um, no, you're absolutely right. But, but they were not listened to. They were not listened to, or at least they were pushed to the back. Yeah. That's right. Now, if you want to read about some, uh, a famous scientist who was a real jerk, look up Newton. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I was, oh, boy. I was telling my wife the other time. night, I, there's a... There's a book out of like the 100 Greatest Scientists or something like this. This guy, there's a biochemist that decided to write about 200 books like Isaac Asimov. And one of them was about, you know, the, the, the 100 Great Discoveries. And he chronicled a, uh, I forget the name of the mathematician, but his father was a famous mathematician also. And the father, upon learning through <laughs> his son, actually destroying his mathematical theories and coming up with better ones, the father actually disowned his son hmm. and kicked him out of the house and was never he never spoke to him again. And this kid was brilliant and correct, and the father wasn't. So, I mean, and the father was given a lot of credit for a lot of things. And so, when you learn these horrible personality traits about people that you really respect, right? Most of the early scientists were trying to prove God right. Hmm. So they, they set out to show what God's principles were and things of this sort. Whether you believe in that or not, uh, is beside the point. Science doesn't start out to prove anything. In mm-hmm. fact, it starts out to disprove things, not to prove things. So, And that's where the scientists are not to be trusted, I think, because once you win a Nobel Prize, you can talk about anything. It's very people, sad. It's very sad. will believe you. You know, it's it's improved somewhat, but there's still plenty of jerks. No. <laughs> And there's right. a and there are hero worshippers and there are you know that sort of thing and look at look at what's happening. I mean, the press has done a remarkable job of revealing the soft underbelly of heroes and in particular uh, sports heroes that look great on the outset, right? And then all of a sudden, all this drug use and uh, purposeful induction of co- concussions by a coach for an entire football team that used to give out bonuses for the number of people they injured during a game. Can you believe that? And this guy is still coaching. Uh, that's absolutely astounding, I think. Well, I think it, the real, as Alan said, trust science, not scientists. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. I think I actually quoted that yes, one Yes, I believe. Of course you did. <laughs> of course you did. I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Speaking of trust science, let's do some picks. Hey, hey, um, hey. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a fun little video. <clears throat> um that's about international standards and why they matter and standards for things like scientific experiments and, and industry. And it is framed through the delightful story of the internationally standardized cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. So this guy talks about how the, the ISO, which sets these, it's a standards body that sets these, uh, these uh, standards for all sorts of things does have an official standard for brewing a cup of tea for doing taste Brr, tests. Remarkable. And the guy explains why we need that. And then he goes and he buys the, the $40 document that allows you to, to follow this protocol and talks about the fact that uh, it's in fact, there, there are some controversial aspects to it. Controversy in s- sipping a there cup is, of tea. There is controversy <laughs> in how to brew tea, yes. I think that's Well, I need to read this because uh, this is, a, this is a, a subject I contemplate every morning. Okay. Right. As I brew my tea, I <laughs> will have a fun. close look at this. You can, you can decide whether you, <laughs> whether you side with the majority or with Ireland on the correct brewing of a cup <laughs> of tea. Uh, and speaking of standards, uh, real scientific standards were recently redefined. Uh, yes. For the oh, kilogram, right. correct. The That's ampere, right. the That's Keltman, right. and That's the right. mole. Yep. So a kilogram uh, in the new standard is exactly equal to one pound, right? <laughs> that wrong? Is that right. Brexit's view or just the rest of the? <laughs> right. That's right. Rich, what do you have for us? 
Uh, well, somebody had to do it. I yep. picked the yeah. uh, recent Mars InSight mission. There you go. Cool. This is the uh, lander that uh, landed on Mars just uh, last week um, and is there to uh, do a lot of seismology, apparently, and some also some temperature probes of the core and et cetera. But I just like the fact that they can fly these robots there and yeah. you know send back all this stuff. And I'm always... This is, I picked the uh, NASA site for this, so you can find out just about anything you want on this site. I'm always fascinated by how they engineer the landing itself, because they've done several different versions of this over the years. And this is a pretty uh, classic, uh, you know, drop the lander out of, I guess it was an orbiting spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, so I uh, think they no, established no, a, no, 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 no. They it's, went straight this in. They went straight in at 17,000 miles an hour. Oh, wow. They had a chute that opened just before impact. Well, and then that, they had they a did, rocket. That, it, they had a rocket powered lander. Yeah. This mm -hmm. thing came down on rockets totally free. Elon of, Musk. Elon. Right. No, no, he didn't invent that. <laughs> uh, yeah. That. So it had, it had a heat shield that it jetted. That's right. And, well, the, and then the parachute. And then the, uh, uh, and then the last uh, bit was a powered. A power descent, which is just remarkable. It was incredible. Now, I have a question for you, Rich. If you could go back and look at all the probes that we sent to Mars, all of them, and add up all the, um, how shall I put this, shit that we have left on the surface of Mars, uh. not associated with the actual mission itself, we're a sloppy species. Of course we are. Look at look at the orbits uh, around Earth. Incredible. We have so much yeah. junk. It is how, I mean, how saw, dare we gravity right <laughs> how dare we if i did i did i mean i just well, i'm the, the, just appalled the, by us <laughs> the other distraction associated with this is that there was a uh parallel uh mission now i'm gonna mess this up uh because they set up a couple of other probes along with it oh yeah uh, the uh, mini and, probes that's right yeah the and suitcase size probes that's yes right. I forget what they're called. Yeah, I do too. Uh, though, but yeah. they set up, they, yeah, these things are, they weigh 30 pounds. Exactly. That are like little mini probes or satellites. Yeah. And they were, uh, they have sent these up around the earth before. And there's, turns out that there's a, an upcoming mission manned to the, uh, an upcoming unmanned mission to the moon where they're going to, along the way, drop 13 of these things. <laughs> right. But it, <clears throat> this was the first interplanetary use of these uh, probes. So, and the function, it was, they were flyby. So yeah. <clears throat> they sort of, um, uh, I guess they were contained in the original rocket, but separated it and sort of uh, separated from it and sort of trailed exactly. uh, the InSight probe exactly. on its trip to Mars. And then as the probe was landing, they were able to relay information right. from the probe back to Earth when it was uh, otherwise would have been out of communication with the Earth because it was on the backside right. of Mars. That's correct. That is okay. exactly correct. Okay, but I, I take some heart in the fact, Alan, that all of that stuff circulating around Earth right now will all fall back down and burn up in the atmosphere. And burn up in the atmosphere. But that doesn't Mars, happen. Won't. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It'll be there when we colonize the place, right? Oh, look, here's an old parachute. Maybe we sure. can use it for... Oh. I saw a tweet the other day said, NASA just landed another probe with pinpoint accuracy on Mars. I think I'll trust them on climate change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> See that? That's great. That is great. Yeah, though. really. Come that on. is. That's right. That's right. Dixon, what do you have? Well, I didn't have time to put it in there because I arrived there. a little bit. There. I oh, put it in. Sorry, I put I'm it sorry. in for you, Dixon. I, I took my grandson this morning along with my wife to the Bronx Botanical Garden to see the annual train show, which is up starting in the middle of November. And it goes all the way through, I think, until uh, January. It is remarkable. It is remarkable. The, all the buildings are iconic New York City buildings, and they're all made from natural products. And they're constructed, by the way, in Kentucky. There's a workshop in Kentucky that's busy all year long making new additions to this train show. And you can see the original Pennsylvania station with, of course, an electric Pennsylvania train set coming right out of it. And we took our three-year-old son, our grandson, rather, to this, we'll post some photographs, of course, of them. Rich, I know this is particularly near and dear to your heart because you're really attached to your grandkids as well. And 
This is the first time we've ever had a chance to really show him something iconic in the way of annual events, right? And we think about the Nutcracker Suite, too, but he's a little young for that one. He went crazy. How old is he? He's three. Okay. He's three, but he's very very, um, articulate. He's very observant. He's got a fascination with mechanics. And he was, I said, Ivan, what was your favorite exhibit? He said, oh, the bumblebee train. And it was a little black and yellow painted, it looked like a trolley car with someone on the inside, but the outside had little eyes and little antenna, and this thing kept zooming back and forth between the terminal and the next terminal, and he sat there for about 10 minutes and just was absolutely absorbed. (laughs) And I'm going to show that picture because to see the innocence and the uh, amount of attention that he paid to that was just, that was my first visit to it also, by the way. We had a wonderful time, so I would like to share that with all of you. As a, as a holiday gift from me to you. Cool. I'm actually laughing at Kathy's pick. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. Yes. Uh, so Comedy and Wildlife break. Photo Award finalists. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I didn't mean yes. to steal your thunder. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> these finalists for 2018, this came out in mid-September. And at first I thought, I think, I think some of these could be Photoshopped. And it, it <laughs> seems like it, but th- they just go on and... And they're hilarious. There's, there's polar bears <laughs> dancing. There's yes. uh, some some other couple of large animals sort of dancing. Yeah, some other a whole bunch of things that look like they're laughing. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're it's just really great. really fun. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> like a bear, large like animal a bears nose behind a birch tree and uh, rabbit. It's awesome. Yeah, it's they're all awesome. they're great. So they're just. They're just fun. Yeah, and it is. Totally fun. Yeah, it's it's yeah. great. I love it. <laughs> uh, my, <laughs> I have a pick is a tweet from the staff of Senator Gillibrand, who um, New York. writes from New York. I've been disturbed to read reports about acute flaccid myelitis, a debilitating polio-like disease that's affecting children around the country. Today, I'm calling on congressional appropriators to include emergency funding to support CDC's efforts. She wants a, a billion dollars to be put towards <clears throat> this disease, which we've talked about and which in some cases at least may be caused by um, enterovirus D68. And in Gee, fact... Somebody with experience working on that virus should probably get on this. I think so, I think so. <laughs> so there, there is a um, task force that has been formed. I'm not on it. But it's a meeting next Tuesday in Atlanta to try and figure out what's going on. And there's a another force. What's the name of that? What would be another name? Um, anyway, I'm on the other one, <laughs> <laughs> which is to unite clinicians and basic scientists and see how, to, how they can work together. Not a task force. Uh, at, anyway. Um, and also, just parenthetically, we started a crowdfunding effort. Just by the, by the yes. way, since you picked this tweet, I have to provide the disclaimer that, like reading comments on science stories, don't yep. read the replies. No, no, no. Don't read the replies. Yeah, just the tweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we've started a crowdfunding uh, effort one month to raise yeah. $15,000 to support our research on EVD68. We don't have any funding for that at the moment. So I'll give the link for that. And, and uh, I'm uh, really interested that, um, you know, several mothers who have children with AFM have written in, and in particular one who's going to the task force. She said, we could get this funded in no time. You know, she can, she's got a network of parents and so forth. It's very touching. You know, these kids get paralyzed, and some of them don't re- recover, and they have to have extensive therapy. Oh. And we don't really understand if it's just 68 or other viruses or what, so... Right. It does need some investigation. Right. We have a listener pick from Fernando who writes, Hi, Twiv crew. A few echoes for your 519 picks and banter. Rich and Voyages of Discovery reminded me of two recent readings. Pathfinders by Felipe Fernandez Armesto is a great global history of discovery. Warts and all. <laughs> yeah, there are plenty of warts, as we just said, right? Plenty of words. Erebus by Michael Palin. Yes, the former Monty Python oh. is a can't-put-it-down history of HMS Erebus. It's Antarctic and Arctic misadventures and col- English colonial spirit at its most colorful. <laughs> Dixon's coming to visit my hometown of Lisbon. 
reminded me that Lisbon is home to a tropical medicine institute, a yep. leftover from yep. Portuguese colonial days that might be of interest to him, and of some outstanding fish restaurants. Oh. And he gives a link for that. Thank you so much. And one in particular, well, <laughs> it's called The Fork. Or I guess it's a place where you could look at different restaurants. Exactly. He's got a recommendation for you, Dixon. Right, I'll be glad to read I can't pronounce it. We'll, we'll do it. Thank you, uh, Fernando. That'll do it for so Twib. Path, Pathfinders looks good. I'm going to have to get that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Twib 522. We are marching towards 1,000. No, it's too soon to say that. <laughs> <laughs> We're marching toward 523. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. We are. We are. Now that you can find Twib on any podcast player. And you all use different ones. Just search for TWIV or This Week in Virology. Please subscribe. It really helps us if you subscribe because then when we release an episode, it gets automatically downloaded to you. We see that number. And the more downloads we have, the better we're able to support the show. And, uh, of course, as always, questions and comments. TWIV at microbe.tv. If you want to support us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. And go subscribe to me on YouTube. Uh, let's see how many we have so far. <laughs> we started out at... You can get um, them on one toe. <laughs> started out at uh, about 16,000. Mm. And as of today, we have 17,200, 194 subscribers. If each of them gave a dollar, you'd have your um, challenge met. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take much. No. Uh, you could go to YouTube. Just search for Vincent Rack and Yellow. I will not do that tell. right after this podcast ends or when you get home or to That's your work. Right. If you're don't driving. don't exactly. hit an embankment, though. No. Don't hit an embankment. Please. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Yes. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. When are you going to Portugal? Uh, December 9th, and we'll be back on Christmas Eve. Soon. So Soon. we'll miss you for a few twivs. You probably will. All right. Have a good trip and eat lots of good fish. I will give you a full report when I return. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. And in and, and your tweets, you can read the comments. It's okay? Um, I don't know. I don't check them. I, I check about <laughs> once a day on Twitter. So I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for the support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is Virology.